Okie doke. All right, there you go, Jim. I got it again. Okay, thanks, Matt. Yep. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and start the webinar. Re ready? Yep. <laughs> Well, hello, welcome to Life's Copilot's uh, expert panel. Today is one I'm extremely excited about. We, I've been looking forward to this one ever since I found out about Tamara and what she does. Um, Tamara Weaver, in the department, uh, she's a, a Deputy Attorney General. She is uh, with the Consumer Protection Division. And we're here to talk about how to protect yourself and your loved ones from elder abuse, a lot of it in the financial and cyber world and what have you. And I'll let her kind of do what she wants to do with that. But uh, I'm just very excited about uh, turning this over to her and letting her get going. So can you get your, can you do your screen share from there? Or? I should be able to. Um, you do what you want to do. Up and hopefully, oops, there we go. I don't know, can you see? It looks perfect. Okay. And if I do that, do you still see the regular Perfect. presentation? Everything's okay. good, yes. Great. <laughs> Make sure that it's in the, the right mode and you guys aren't, you know, subject to my, my notes and, and annotations, but you just see the full slides. And I gave you a really, you know, just a very a, a tiny uh, introduction. Why don't you let us know about who you are before we get into all that stuff too, so. Absolutely. Yeah. So as Jim said, my name is Tamara Weaver. Um, I'm one of the attorneys in the Consumer Protection Division at the Indiana Attorney General's Office. Um, we've got a, a large office, about 400 employees, um, about half of those attorneys um, in various different sections, um, mainly located in Indianapolis, but a, a few other offices uh, around the state of Indiana as well. Um, I've been with the office for, well, let's see, it's 2022. So almost 12 years now. Um, I'm a native of Northwest Indiana. I grew up near Chicago. Um, and now live uh, down south, according to my family in the Indianapolis <laughs> area. <laughs> um, so I, I've worked in a, a number of different areas of our office, um, most recently in, in consumer protection, um, but I've also worked in our victim services division under a previous administration as well. Um, so really have seen a lot of different fact patterns and bad actors and issues that have come up when it comes to vulnerable individuals um, in our state and really around the country. Um, and I put our senior population in that, that category um, for, for a few reasons. Um, and I think as, as we talk about consumer protection today and elder scam prevention and abuse prevention, um, you'll see that if you are a senior yourself, um, hopefully some tips and tricks to help you avoid being scammed or taken advantage of. Um, if you're a caregiver or a family or a friend uh, of a senior, um, some things for you to keep in mind and to discuss with them um, if you see some of these red flags or, or you want to get more involved in protecting them, um, particularly financially, um, is, is the angle that we look at. Um, on this slide here, my, my contact info information is up there, my phone number, my email. Um, so if you have questions at, at a later date and, and we can't get to them today, please feel free to reach out. Um, I'll put that up again at the end of the presentation. So in case you, you miss it this time around, it'll still be there. Um, and as always, reaching out to our, our, our gracious host, um, Life's Co-Pilot and, and Jim here, um, he'd be able to get you in touch with me if you have any specific questions you'd like to discuss. Before I, I dive really into the, the weeds on the scam prevention and the financial exploitation, um, I want to give you an overview of consumer protection and kind of why, why that matters and why we put our senior protection and our elder abuse in consumer protection. Um, we're going to talk about data privacy in particular as well, so identity theft, um, everyone's favorite topic, do not call, um, and we're going to talk about common scams and looking for red flags and ways to prevent um, that abuse or exploitation from happening. So in Indiana, our consumer protection division handles a lot of different topics um, from medical licensing, so that's medical professionals, to professional licensing, um, think real estate, um, non-medical folks. Um, we have a whole section that does mediation issues with consumers and businesses. Um, we have our consumer litigation section, of which I'm a part of. Um, we handle identity theft issues, data breaches. So you may have heard of, you know, the latest company to have a data breach, whether it's a large insurer or you know, retail store or bank. Um, we handle the telephone privacy, which is the do not call, do not fax, do not text, all of those do nots that, that we hope businesses abide by. Um, we have a homeowner protection unit um, and more. Uh, as I mentioned, I've been with the office for almost 12 years and, and I swear I learned something new, um, not infrequently that we're able to, to help folks with when it comes to consumer protection. 
And when it comes to it, I mean, the base of our authority lies in Indiana law, right? So our, our General Assembly and, and the state legislatures across the country have empowered the attorneys general to protect consumers in any number of ways. Um, so it's, it's to make sure that we've got um, a fair marketplace that understands that there are certain rules and requirements we want businesses to abide by and things that we want consumers to be aware of as well when they're entering into these transactions. Um, we have what I like to call our, our bread and butter deceptive consumer sales act. So that's our really broad general consumer protection statute that says you can't commit, if you're a business, unfair, abusive, or deceptive acts against consumers, right? So we want the agreement to be fair. We want the work that's promised to be done to be done. We want the payments that are promised to be made to be made. Um, and it's really focused on those day-to-day -day consumer transactions. Um, people might think, oh gosh, consumer transaction, I don't know if I'm really engaging in those. Um, and I encourage people to think about even just their day so far today, how many transactions you've been a part of, um, whether you drove in a car that you had purchased, um, you bought gas, you bought a cup of coffee, you're using an internet service provider probably right now to access this. Um, you may be using um, you know, notepad or pens that you purchased, or you might have a magazine subscription that just came in the mail or a delivery that just arrived. Um, and really thinking about all of those times that you enter into those transactions, um, thinking about the terms of them and, and really making that decision and saying, this is a, a transaction I want to be involved in and I'm willing to pay X amount of dollars for this, this good or service um, and holding the, the business or the person on the other end to their promise as well. Um, we also, um, as this slide mentions, um, have, have fo some focuses on particular areas um, that might be problematic or that we've seen issues in in the past. So the Home Improvement Contracts Act really focuses on those um, home improvement transactions. So the new roof, the siding, the bathroom remodel, the, the floor re being redone, um, and making sure that there are specific terms that folks know have to be in those contracts. And it might vary from state to state, but almost all the states will have some sort of requirement here. Um, and that's really to make sure, again, that everybody's clear on what this transaction involves um, so that no one's taken advantage of and that the terms are very clear. Um, we also have laws in most of the states um, involving home solicitation sales. So that's the door-to-door -door, um, magazine sales now used to be, you know, the vacuum um, or now I see a lot of the, the lawn care or pest control companies going door-to-door. -door. Um, and so there's rules and requirements uh, that might vary by state um, when it comes to those entities as well. Again, providing those protections for consumers to say, okay, here's what this transaction needs to include in order for us to, to determine that it's a fair transaction. Um, and then two areas that I think sometimes um, folks might think are a little boring or in the weeds, but I really enjoy are our, our antitrust laws. Um, so going and looking at and investigating and, and litigating um, the violations of our state and federal antitrust law. So really ensuring a competitive marketplace that, that everybody is, is playing by the rules um, and that we get the best prices as consumers um, that are artificially inflated because of, of violations of, of the law there. Um, and then our nonprofit act. Um, I think every transaction you enter into as a consumer, um, you're giving up your hard earned money and you wanna make sure that it's going to exactly what you wanted it to go to, whether it's to buy you know, a new pair of shoes um, or in this instance, to donate to a charitable cause. Uh, you should be able to rely on the fact that when you've donated to a charity and they say it's going to be used for a certain purpose, that it will be used for that purpose um, and that individuals aren't gonna personally benefit from that, but really the charitable cause is gonna be um, supported. And so I think those are some key areas when it comes to consumer protection um, to really focus on and to think in particular about how senior consumers might be engaging in those transactions um, or having somebody come door to door, uh, whether it's to sell magazines or to say that they're in the neighborhood and doing roof repairs um, and really be aware of that when it comes to, to their finances. Specifically in, in Indiana and across the country, there are senior consumer protection acts that kick into place when there are consumers who are 60 or older. So we have special statutes that really are aimed at protecting uh, senior consumers and preventing that financial exploitation or abuse. Um, so really it's focused on preventing and enforcing against those who commit financial exploitation um, using deception or intimidation um, that can include breaches of, of fiduciary duties, it could be fraud, it could be extortion, um, withholding of, of care could be 
um, one of the factors as well. And looking at whether the person who's, who's perpetrating the, these acts is someone who's in a position of trust or confidence. So that could be a relative, could be a roommate, um, someone with a, a power of attorney or maybe a financial advisor um, and upping the penalties for those who might be in one of those positions. Um, so this allows us to, to kind of further investigate specific issues um, relating to senior consumers um, when it comes to the consumer protection um, side of things. And so it's, it's really looking at misappropriation of assets of a consumer um, or, or not following through on those particular promises, um, but doing it in a way that seems to be targeting consumers. Um, there are a few examples that, that we've used this particular statute to, to protect consumers. Um, so I would just wanna tell you a little bit about those cases to give you an idea of what this kind of protection looks like in, in the consumer protection realm when we're talking about financial, financial exploitation or using seniors' assets without um, their authority. One of them comes from an estate sale company that, as you would imagine, signed contracts with, with individuals um, to sell items left in relatives' houses um, and then to take those proceeds and, and pay those to the, the surviving relatives. In this instance, the company did not do that. Well, they held the sales um, and they sold the property, but then they didn't turn over the proceeds. And so you could see how in this instance, um, we had a pattern of, of relatives and consumers who were seniors themselves um, dealing with loved ones, estates, and, and trying to you know, dispose of their property um, and still trying to figure out how to financially take care of things. Um, and so they kept the proceeds, um, they kept the unsold property um, and, and didn't turn it over to, to the family members. And so there we were able to use the, the Senior Consumer Protection Act um, in our investigation and in our litigation there as well. Um, so there we've got kind of a, a business that, that's taking advantage of, of senior consumers. Um, we also had another one that involved more, more personal relationships and, and individuals. Um, it was a, a mother-son scheme that took advantage of a, a senior consumer and exploited her out of over $130,000 um, some of the more egregious uh, lies, I'll, I'll say, that they, they told were that they needed money to pay for school, and they went so far as to make fake invoices from schools to show to this the senior that they'd befriended um, to get her to pay them money so that they could use the money for themselves and not for educational purposes whatsoever. Um, they made up fake emails and, and a lot of false representations to this individual. And it was one of those personal relationships that they kind of cultivated um, in order to develop this scheme to take the senior consumer's money. Um, and, and we'll talk about kind of scam prevention tips and red flags and, and techniques in a little bit, but I just wanna give some one more example about this particular statute um, and, and how we're able to, to use it in particular when it comes to senior consumers. Um, the last example really involves multiple cases, um, but they were all home improvement contractors uh, that appeared to be from our best assessment targeting senior consumers, or at least had an overwhelming number of their consumers um, who were over the age of 60. And it involved time and time again, promising to do work, collecting money, and then not giving refunds and not doing the work. Um, and so it's it's really a pattern we see, unfortunately, a lot really across the, the state and across the country. And when it happens to, to senior consumers, we know folks who might be on limited or fixed budgets and those couple hundred or even in, in many instances, couple thousand dollars um, are really gonna make or break their monthly budget, um, whether they're able to pay their other utility bills or, or other bills that they might have. So, so those are some of the instances where we're looking at specific consumer protection issues that affect senior consumers um, and, and using some of those tools that we have on a state level um, to protect folks. I know we might have folks from, from different places, but if you're looking for information, and, and really this would apply kind of regardless of your geographic location on consumer protection issues, you can always visit the Indiana Attorney General's website. Um, we have a specific consumer page, indianaconsumer.com. Um, I've highlighted some of the areas that might be of interest to you, whether it's do not call, um, filing a complaint, or our senior center that has downloadable resources on particular interest issues that might be of interest. So it could be um, the telemarketing or robocalls. And I think the home improvement uh, scams are also located on that page as well. Um, and links to other entities that might have more information. 
um, that you might be interested in. So always, I think your attorney general's office, whatever state you're in, should be a, a, a resource when it comes to consumer protection issues. If you're looking to file a complaint or have a question or, or looking for outreach and education on, on any number of topics. One thing that um, some states have, and Indiana is one of them, is a statewide council. Um, here it's called the Indiana Council Against Senior Exploitation, or INCASE, um, and its mission is to empower Indiana communities to prevent and end senior exploitation and elder abuse. Um, and so it's a coalition, a voluntary coalition of government entities, of service providers, of um, We've got law enforcement, we've got uh, local, state, and federal government, I, I should mention as well, um, and in particular, those who do education and outreach and, and folks I like to call who are boots on the ground, right, dealing with um, senior consumers day in, day out on, on whatever the issue might be, whether it's a Medicare issue, whether it's a housing issue, um, and really the focus is using education, encouragement, and empowerment, um, and, and trying to get information in the hands of those who need it and would be able to benefit from it. Um, I mentioned to, to Jim right before we started this that we're working on an elder abuse guide um, through this council uh, that we hope to have later this year uh, for folks to be able to view and, and kind of uh, one-stop shop, if you will, of, of information for the state of Indiana. I know other states have this. I know Michigan has it. I know Vermont's got one. Um, I think California has one as well. So there are a lot of different states kind of across the country that have information distilled down in, in one place for you. Um, so this is another resource I, I wanted to make sure that folks had um, that really is focused on that elder exploitation and elder abuse prevention um, and giving you some ideas of, of other folks you might want to talk to or other resources um, you might want to take a look at if you're looking for, for answers or if you've got questions. I do want to walk through just the, the logistics of if you have a senior consumer protection issue. So there's you know financial exploitation or a violation of any of our other consumer protection laws. Um, I, I can't let it go. I want to make sure that you know how to file a complaint with our office and how to trigger our office's involvement um, because as many at times as you may know about a particular you know, bad actor business or someone that you suspect might be violating the law, if you don't tell us, it's really hard for us to find out. And we really rely on our consumers to give us that information. Um, we process tens of thousands of complaints um, every year and we really need that information to be able to figure out where exactly we need to focus our resources. Um, as with, I think, any um, Office of the Attorney General, consumer complaint forms should be located on their website. Um, for us, we've got an online form you can fill out or you can print it and mail it out. Um, we can talk to you over the phone about it, answer your questions, but we can't take your complaint over the phone. We'll need a signed consumer complaint form. Um, and then once you've done that, it'll go through an intake process where we review it. Um, if it's within our jurisdiction, we'll get a mediator assigned to it, and then we'll have our mediation process kind of kick into to play there where we have a mediator assigned to it um, who will communicate with you and with the, the business um, and try to resolve the issue. In that instance, we have the consumer complaint come in, you get a letter saying, we got your complaint, we send your complaint to the business, we hear back from the business, you get a chance to respond and kind of back and forth it goes um, with our mediation. Um, and this is really focused again on those consumer transactions, right? So those day-to-day -day transactions that you might be entering into your loved one um, at, at any given time, really. Um, and if you've got documents to support it, we would love to see those documents, copies of them only, please don't send us originals. Um, and we'll reach out to you by mail or email, depending on your preference. Um, as with anything, if it's not within our jurisdiction, we'll try to refer it to the, the closest place we can tell that might have jurisdiction, whether that's another state agency or it might be a federal issue. Um, and remember that your attorney general can't act as your private attorney, um, but that you may be a consumer in a case that they're investigating or that they prosecute at a later date. And when we're looking at these consumer transactions, one thing I, I wanna make sure you remember is we're talking about any of those transactions for, for personal reasons, for in Indiana, familial, charitable, household, agricultural issues, those are all consumer transactions. Um, and, and every one of those complaints is gonna get reviewed as it comes in and we'll determine kind of the best course of action that we can take for you um, or on your behalf. All right, now I wanna dig into some of the, the more substantive issues when it comes to preventing identity theft and data privacy issues that might affect our senior consumers. Um, I like to think of 
identity theft in a couple different ways, one being low tech, one being high tech. Um, so the low tech is you lost your wallet. You know, you, you left your credit card at the gas station, you dropped it at the grocery store, um, or kind of more nefariously, someone went through your mail or your trash and took a credit card statement, took, um, you know, insurance statement or, or an explanation of benefits, um, and has your personal information. That's more the low tech side of things that I think feel a little bit like we might have more control over that, right? So that's, that's where I think that having good practices when it comes to shredding information that comes in the mail um, or opting for e-versions of things where you have to log into an account instead of getting a lot of paper documents um, that you're going to have to shred anyway, um, really keeping track of your cards, um, credit cards, debit cards, driver's license, um, not carrying your social security card around with you, those kinds of practices. I think that you know, as an average citizen, we can we can get on board with those are things that we can easily accomplish um, the other side of things the high-tech identity theft that's a little bit harder and, and I understand that um, especially our senior consumers might feel a little bit more out of control when it comes to that right so we can't prevent the the bank from being data breached um, but what we can do is have strong passwords right so senior consumers um, anyone who's helping a, an elder um, with their banking with their financials um, making sure that, the number of people who have access to those accounts is limited. Um, you've got strong, secure passwords um, that aren't shared among multiple sites. Um, so quick tip, whatever password you're using for your online banking account, don't use that password anywhere else, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a numbers game. If you use that password also for you know, the local newspaper login and for your prescription, um, you know, your pharmacy website, the more times it's out there, the more chances it has to be caught up in a breach and then used in another um, nefarious act later on. So if we can do a quick tip, if you make sure that whatever account, uh, password you use for your bank account, you're not using anywhere else, put that on your list of, of something to do later today or after you watch this, um, and, and we'll make a little to-do list as we go. Uh, you also want to make sure um, when it comes to all of these emails that we get, right? I mean, you and me both, we, we get them and sometimes they seem like they're coming from a legitimate institution. It looks like it might be our bank. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell. Um, or if you're helping um, a senior consumer with their finances, you might be getting a lot of emails yourself and then you're reviewing their emails. Um, so really making sure that if, if anything looks suspicious, you're not clicking on the links within the email itself. Um, that's something that, that I advise you know, myself, my family, uh, my mom, my, my in-laws. Um, if it doesn't seem quite right, go directly to the website itself. Um, so if it's, you know, something from, you know, a delivery from Amazon, go directly to the Amazon website. If it's about your prescription, go directly to the CVS website. And, and that way, you know, you're going to the exact website you want to go to, and you're not clicking on a link um, that somebody has, has put together that's going to send you somewhere else and collect all sorts of information. Um, if you do find yourself in the unfortunate position of having had your identity theft um, or your identity stolen, we're gonna want you to file a police report and then you can file an identity theft complaint with our office as well, with the attorney general's office. Um, one way is, as we're talking about kind of tips and, and things to avoid this is shredding those papers. That's the low tech solution, right? So shred anything with personal information, um, review your credit report. And we'll talk about that in a minute, the, the specifics of, of how to do that um, to kind of keep an eye on your finances. Um, in particular, those accounts that you might not be logging into frequently, um, you can request a free credit freeze. We'll also walk through those steps. So we'll add a couple more things to your to-do list. And then, as I mentioned, if your identity has been stolen, filing that police report and then getting a complaint on file with our office as well. Um, you should also call your bank or credit card company, whatever financial institution that, that might be involved as well. So credit reports. This is the website you want to use, annualcreditreport.com. This is the free website. This is the one that's authorized by the federal government. Um, if you go to another website and you type it slightly wrong or you can't quite remember it and they're asking you to pay a fee for this, you've gone to the wrong website, back out, pick a new website. This is the one that you want to go to. Um, it used to be that you could only check your credit report from each of the three credit um, agencies once a year. And so I would recommend people, okay, we'll check Equifax in March, check Experian in the summer sometime, TransUnion in the fall. Now you can do it weekly from any of the credit agencies. Um, so what I would do is, is set a reminder. So let's add another to-do item uh, to your list and that's to check your credit report with each of these agencies. 
it may be may have been a minute since you've you've checked it, um, or it may have been recently. Maybe you um, financed something, bought a car, had it had a loan, um, and so you know that it was just pulled recently, and and you know your credit score, you know all the things that are on it. Awesome. Check it again. Um, pull one from from each of them, um, and make sure that it's accurate. That all the lines of credit that you were expecting are there, um, and that it's it's accurate in terms of your timeliness of your payments and, and any other um, factors that are there. So go ahead and put that on your to do list as well. Um, you're making sure your bank account password is not the same anywhere else, and you're checking your credit report. And while you're checking your credit report, you can put a credit freeze in place. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard of this. This is something that we've been talking about for, for really a number of years now. And this is really one of those preventative measures you can do um, that, that I, I like to have in place and I like to you know, encourage others to, to use as a way of something you can do affirmatively to protect your finances um, or protect a senior consumer's finances that you might be taking care of or, or might um, be working with on their finances. So you have to do it for each of the three credit agencies. What this does is freezes your credit so that no one can open another line of credit in your name. Um, it's very easy to implement. All of them offer the online option to do it. Um, these are the websites last I checked, um, which was very recently. Um, but if you have any questions, um, go through the, the main website, you know, transunion.com, experian.com, equifax.com and, and navigate to that. This is free for Indiana residents. Um, there are some states where there might be a small fee when it comes to, to freezing credit or, or unfreezing it. Um, so that's something you'll, you may want to double check, but it's a, it's a minimal fee, maybe five to ten dollars. Um, you'll be get a pin for each of these. I know another number you have to remember, but keep this pin in a safe place because you can unfreeze your credit at any time. So say you put a freeze in now and then in a year you need to buy a new car and you'd like to take out a loan. You can unfreeze it with the pin for 10, 14 days and then put it right back in place. Once the credit's been pulled, the transaction's gone through, you know that the freeze is in place. This does not lower your credit score whatsoever, putting a freeze in place or lifting it. It doesn't freeze any existing lines of credit. So it's not gonna mess up your mortgage or um, your Kohl's card or any you know, loan payments that, that might be existing. Um, and so it's not going to affect the, those existing lines of credit, but it's something that you can do if you want to put something in place affirmatively to stop those lines of credit from, from being opened. Um, and you can still order your credit report when the freeze is in place. So if we, we make this item number three on your to-do list, put the credit freeze in place, if you do them out of order and you do number three first, you can still go back and do number two and pull your credit report. Um, so we're making sure our bank account's not the same uh, password as anywhere else. We're pulling a credit report and we're putting a credit freeze in place. So those are your, your three to-do items um, so far. So far, and I think I might have a few more as we go along. As I mentioned at the outset, everyone's favorite, do not call. I know, I feel like the woman on this slide all the time, stop calling me. Um, the, the best thing you can do, there's a lot of things you can do here. So we'll talk about making sure you're on the do not call list. Um, we know that you still get calls and we know that the people who are calling you are probably violating the law. We know that, we're on it. Um, we have a whole data privacy and identity theft unit that works on telephone privacy issues and do not call issues. Um, the top complaints we usually get about calls um, usually involve credit services, um, car warranties, um, and then the others are really scams, like a phishing scam looking for personal information um, or a vacation scam. And sometimes we see the home security scams as well. So those are some of the, the topics that people might be calling about um, when it comes to these very frequent repeated calls that you have. Um, so item number four, make sure you're on the do not call list. So we're adding to our, our to-do list, make sure your number, your landline, any cell phone numbers, um, check your loved ones as well. So if you're working with you know, your parents, your in-laws, um, other senior relatives, um, make sure that their numbers are on this. Uh, the fewer calls they get, the fewer chances they will have to be scammed. Um, you can go to the federal website to check that out. You can look at the Indiana website again. But really the best thing to do is if you don't recognize the number, don't answer it in the first place, right? So you've not confirmed to anybody that that number is a working number. Um, their machines are just gonna keep calling and it won't recognize that you've picked up. It won't recognize that this is a live number that someone might answer. If you do answer, because maybe you're expecting a call, you thought there was gonna be a delivery, you thought it was your doctor's office calling back, and it's not the person you expect, hang up. 
Um, I'm, I'm a Midwesterner and I like to be polite and we've got this thing called Hoosier hospitality and I'm giving you permission to be impolite and to hang up. <laughs> These are people who've intruded on your day. Um, they are not someone that you wanna talk to and they might in fact be trying to do you financial harm by taking your personal information. Um, so you do not have to be polite to them. You may hang up without saying anything further. Um, as a next step, you can consider blocking. Um, so if there's a particular number that keeps coming through, if it's a, a cell phone, those are usually pretty easy to kind of click through and, and block. You can also talk to the, the phone carrier um, company itself when it comes to blocking. And then if you've got a particular number and you know you have specific voicemails or other information that you think would be useful to us in, in investigating a, a possible do not call violation, report it to us as well. So you can do that um, on the Attorney General's website um, in the consumer uh, page as well. So it'd be a do not call complaint um, or a violation um, and provide whatever information you can um, to us to, to help us, right? So there are some instances, I know recently we've been able to take action against some local entities that have been involved in large international um, kind of phone schemes, if you will. Um, if it's within our jurisdiction, um, we are able to investigate and, and take enforcement action. Um, a lot of times it's not within our jurisdiction. And so that's where we work with our federal partners and really even international partners as well. Um, there are also a lot of technology solutions that I don't claim to fully understand, um, but know that are in place to attempt to prevent these calls from even making it to our phones in the first place. Um, so there's a lot of work being done because we know that this is not only annoying, and I think we, we kind of joke about it sometimes with how annoying it is that the phone's always ringing, uh, but it's a serious financial matter when it comes to how many phone calls are made and how many dollars people are scammed out of because of these individuals using the phones um, in this manner. So I, I think it's, it's something that we all complain about um, and that really we take seriously um, and, and work to enforce violations if we can um, when they're in, within our jurisdiction. So everyone, remember step four on your to-do list is make sure that you're on the do not call list. I want to talk now about some scams that might be targeting senior consumers um, or that really senior consumers should be um, particularly concerned about or, or aware of. Um, right now, too, it's getting to be tax season. Um, so making sure that you get your tax return filed under your Social Security number um, before someone else has the opportunity to do so. Um, this Unfortunately, this next item, this IRS scam, I have been talking about for years. Um, it's where the caller impersonates the IRS. Um, they make threats unless you pay, um, usually with some sort of prepaid gift card or, or wiring money. Um, those from basically here on out, I'm going to say major red flags. Um, paying with a gift card, wiring money, huge red flags when it comes to transactions and risks for being scammed um, out of that money and not being able to recover it. Um, we know that the IRS is not fully staffed and we know that they're not the ones calling you. Um, so if they say that they're coming from the IRS and that they're going to arrest you unless you send them the numbers from an iTunes gift card, that is not the IRS. That's that's not how government does business. Um, and, and make sure you do not um, fall victim to that. And we'll talk about you know, verifying information from folks who might be contacting you and making sure that it really is a transaction that you want to engage in uh, before you spend your, your hard-earned money. Um, one other one, this I, I kind of stick this on there um, periodically, is one of those, I think it's both low-tech and high-tech um, scams where the scammers use um, these devices called skimmers to get your credit card or your debit card information, um, and they have them attached to um, gas pumps or to ATMs. Um, so low-tech in the sense that you've kind of walked up to it and you just scanned your card um, thinking you were getting gas, and now the information from your card is on this device that the scammer can then go back later and get. Or sometimes with Bluetooth technology these days, they might be able to transmit it um, somewhere close by and, and, and use it. So just one of those that I, I always leave on there kind of perpetually um, to be aware when you're using a, a credit or debit card um, on a machine um, making sure that you're you're checking that there's not anything extra attached on there. Maybe give it a little wiggle or, or kind of yank on it, um, and making sure that it's you know it's it's intact and that it, it doesn't seem to have extra equipment um, tacked onto it. Um, so that I don't think we have a to do item for for this list, um, but but making sure that you're really verifying who's calling you and and taking those steps before um, you decide to engage in a transaction, send any money, um, and remembering that, that 
paying with gift cards or, or wire transfers, those are our big red flags. And we know that our senior consumers get a lot of phone calls. Um, a lot of it has to do with still having a landline that's had the same phone number for a number of years, right? So that number has been on list after list after list. And so it keeps getting cycled through and sold and, and transferred from you know, scammer to scammer. Um, so we really wanna make sure that, that our senior consumers are, are aware of some of the signs of a telemarketing scam, right? So this is to prevent, prevent that financial exploitation, prevent um, someone from being able to kind of bilk you out of your, your hard-earned money. Um, I, I was talking with uh, somebody else, this was maybe a year or so ago, um, about the term, you know, con artist or con man. And the con stands for confidence, right? I mean, you're not going to give your money to seem to someone who seems like they're, you know, bumbling fool. They don't know what's going on. No, the individuals who end up being scammed, the scammers in many instances are very sophisticated. They appear to know what they're talking about. They've got an answer to every question that you have. Um, and so really knowing that we've got a big burden as consumers to try to sort through all of these, these issues that, that might be in front of us um, when it comes to making a decision to, to pay money for something. Um, and it can be kind of intimidating, but knowing that you're allowed to take your time and you can make this decision um, without being rushed, um, I think those are some key things here. Some of these signs um, on, on the screen right now involve you know, statements that you've been specially selected for something that you have no memory of, of entering, um, no interest in, in entering. Um, again, that red flag of transferring money, um, whether it's a wire transfer or if they try to get you to, to pay by uh, check by phones, so like reading the account number off over the phone. Um, we still see instances of telemarketing scams involving the foreign lottery, not so much during COVID because travel has been down. Um, so the odds of someone having traveled somewhere and, and you know, thinking that they might be a winner of a lottery is a little bit lower, but we still see those. Um, so that's where you get a call saying that you've won a foreign lottery, but you know it's international and there's fees and customs and you're gonna have to wire a certain portion of it um, as a security deposit and then they'll send you the full balance and then you can get that refund um, of what you've sent already. That's very clearly not true, not the case. You, you haven't traveled, you haven't entered the lottery, even if you did travel. Um, and so really taking the time to think through the, the likelihood of, of some of these instances of, I don't think I entered this. And, and even if I did, this seems like not the way that this probably works. Um, a lot of times it'll be a a proposal that seems very low risk and very high reward. So kind of in the investment um, realm of things that, that we know seniors are particularly targeted for, um, right? You've worked long and hard, you've amassed some great financial wealth and the scammers know that. Um, they know that you are maybe nervous about how much you have and making it last for as long as your retirement does. And so offering you some quick get rich quick schemes um, to try to entice you to part with some of that hard-earned money that's probably in a very safe um, type of investment right now and putting it somewhere riskier in the hands of a scammer. A lot of times these scammers won't let you make up your mind. So we advise folks, take the time, right? So if it's someone who won't let you pause, ask questions, go back to something, follow up, they're trying to rush you through this and they're trying to gloss over something, right? So it's, it's your ability, your right to take that time to say, I'm gonna talk through this with somebody else. I've got some further questions I'd like to research on your website or somewhere else, um, whether it's with your attorney general's office or with the Federal Trade Commission and any number of sources that might have info um, about these actors um, or really making it personal. So them saying, well, you trust me, right? I wouldn't lie to you. You know, this is clearly the, you know, the best deal for you and I'm not getting a commission, um, really making it um, so that you feel bad saying no and, and you shouldn't feel bad, right? So we'll go back to that. Midwest niceness, I give you permission if it's a scammer, you don't have to feel bad about letting them down. Um, they're a scammer who was trying to take your money and it's okay to say no to them. Uh, they might not protect, uh, provide you with a contract or provide you with any sort of you know, written documentation or email you a quote if you asked for it. Um, they tell you you don't have to research this company, everything's fine. Um, and they don't give you that time, right? So they rush you through things. If you've got unfamiliar companies, um, check them out. Do your research, right? So run them through the state court um, docket system, see if those company names um, show up. If the attorney general's office has sued them, they likely will show up, um, or the BBB or the FTC, um, any number one, uh, any number of those consumer organizations that that track information on businesses um, would be a good place to start. And always talking over these decisions with a trusted 
family member, um, investment advisor, um, and not immediately responding to these offers that you might not understand at first glance. I'm like, well, this seems like it might be good. Then take the time, take the time to research it. Um, and, and we know that in particular, when it comes to our senior consumers, um, you know, they're, They've, they've worked hard, they're in retirement, right? So you have time to sit around and think about it. Um, and some time you have the ability to research it and, and take that extra step to say, I'm gonna look into this further um, and you know, ask for a call back or, or for another way that you can contact the person if you think that it's a legitimate offer. Just a few more of these common scams um, that we see and that we wanna make sure our senior consumers and caregivers know about too. Um, those prize offers, that's sort of like the foreign lottery, right? Um, saying that you have to do something to get your free prize. If it's free, you shouldn't have to do anything. Um, travel packages, especially now as companies and scammers know that people are looking to travel and trying to book those cruises or those trips that they haven't been able to take for, for two years now um, and using that to the scammer's advantage to say, okay, we're going to put together this great package for you. We'll take care of everything. Um, it'll be concierge service. Um, and really it's something that they just straight up scam you and take your money or they offer you such limited dates or you know options that it's not anything that could logistically even happen um, in terms of flights or hotels, whatever the case may be. Um, it could also be um, a health product scam. So think in terms of like vitamins or other supplements, um, in particular for our senior consumers, um, folks who might be managing um, multiple medical conditions and, and really looking for you know, a good way to protect their health, um, being sure to, to pay attention to those and, and really talk to your doctor um, before you, you enter into any of those transactions um, where you're paying a lot of money for something that you might be able to get from the local pharmacy for, for much cheaper or from your doctor directly. And then the last um, couple scams, I, I mentioned some of the work we do in nonprofit investigations. Um, sometimes the, the scammers pretend to be legitimate charities, right? So they choose a name that sounds like the American Cancer Society or sounds like a very well-established you know, national organization, but maybe differs just a little bit. And they're banking on you remembering, hearing about these organizations before and saying, oh gosh, yes, of course, I've heard of this. I heard it on, you know, the Today Show or whatever it is, um, and not realizing that it's a slightly different name or that it's going to a slightly different um, entity that's not a charity at all. Um, there's, we talked about the investments, those get rich quick schemes, and then one of my, I don't know, least favorite or uh, kind of most sad scams is when we have an individual who's been scammed, and then it's a, called a recovery scam. So they're targeted again by a scammer who says, we know you've been scammed and that's so terrible and horrible and we can't believe they would do that. We're gonna help you get back on track. And they're scammers themselves, right? So they ask for you know, deposits or for, for money for them to be able to do this, but it's gonna require a finder's fee or a percent of the money they recover. And they ask for you to pay up front. Um, and, and that's really, I think, one of the, the sadder scams that we've seen um, because we know like I said, it's a numbers game. The scammers keep calling because a certain at a certain point it works. So they have enough people that respond to their scams. Um, and so that's why it's so important for, for our senior consumers and for our caregivers of those to be aware of the kinds of calls that are coming through and the kind of mail that's coming through to, to our consumers' um, households and, and making sure to, to really evaluate those transactions um, to make sure they're exactly what you wanted to enter into and, and isn't something that a scammer is trying to, to pull over on you. I, I've just added some of these um, tech scams. Um, these are ones that, that me and my, my paralegal actually got recently. Um, and I wanted to include just to show you what some of these look like and how easy it could be um, to fall victim to some of them. Um, so you'll see a, a bunch of them have like grayed out um, boxes. That's where I covered up the links because <laughs> I didn't want someone to accidentally click on it or try to go to a website um, that could be you know, potential phishing. Um, you can see some of them use my name. Those are the ones that came to me. Um, there's one on, on the right that it seems to be addressed to a Maria Smith. That's not my paralegal's name. I wouldn't put it on there if, if it were her name. Um, but so she's getting texts thinking that she's somebody else. They're trying to buy her house. That's one of the ones that, that she saw frequently. 
um, looking to make a cash offer on their home. Um, I think it even has an, an address. That's not her address. Um, so I don't know if the, the scammer just kind of got their, their wires crossed there, um, but looking for you know quick ways of, of getting cash. And I mean, I understand in this market, if you're looking to, to downsize saying, well, gosh, maybe that would be a good deal. If I can get you know, a fair price on my house and then I downsize and then have a little bit left over, um, I get it. Um, the other ones are, one of them I got was the link from the photography company. Um, and it happened to be right after my kids' school pictures were coming in. Um, but I looked at it and said, I don't think that's the name of the company. And sure enough, it wasn't. Um, I went to my email and I verified the exact company that we'd used at, at my kids' school. And this wasn't it. So I wasn't going to go click on this link. I went back to my email. I looked up and researched who the company was. Um, and then I ignored this. And I think I even blocked this number that it had come from. So saying, nope, I don't need any more texts from you. Um, but just know that these, these come in and... You don't know um, who they're coming from, right? If it's not coming from one of your, your established contacts. Um, and so treating these unsolicited texts just like you would an unsolicited call. Um, you know, if you don't recognize the number, you know, not responding, um, deleting it, um, you know, blocking the number if, if you desire, I think those are all good options to, to do as well. A new slide I've, I've had to add to some of these presentations, COVID scams. Um, so we, we put the, number for the COVID-19 call center up at the top if you've got further questions about this. Um, but these are materials that were developed from the Federal Trade Commission in partnership with the um, National Association of Attorneys General. Um, so looking out for ways to avoid scams related to COVID, um, one of them related to vaccine scams, one of them related to like travel. So we talked about kind of travel packages and vacation scams. Now we can add COVID vacation scams to the list of, of things that the scammers are using now, um, ways of, of trying to get your personal information while you're trying to submit information to go on a trip um, or trying to, to get information about requirements that might be in place. Um, and so really the advice from before holds true. You're not supposed to share your personal information with just anyone who's asking about it, right? It's got to be someone who's got a, a valid, legitimate reason to use it. Um, and particularly if somebody's asking you for payment for something that should be free, um, those are things that you really want to be on the lookout for, on the lookout for, kind of regardless of the topic area. So whether it's a COVID scam, whether it's a home improvement contractor, whether it's someone calling for a charitable donation, um, really making sure that that you've thought about the transaction and you go through it. Um, before you part with your finances, that's that's always our, our advice for you. So some of these questions I, I liked from, from the FTC, um, and really my favorite is, do I want more calls like this? And if the answer is no, don't answer those numbers you don't recognize. And if you've answered and you realize it's not someone you want to talk to, hang up the phone. Um, you don't need to, to further that conversation um, any further. And, and I think those are key things that if you do, hopefully will decrease the number of calls that you get. Oops. I'm gonna jump past that slide real quick, um, but it's it's still about grandparent scams. So I don't know if you guys have heard about the grandparent scam. Um, it, I heard about it a few years ago and it's still in the news. It's still locally, um, I heard of an instance of it, um, maybe just a couple months ago as well, of a scammer. What they do is impersonate a loved one. Um, so maybe your grandchild or a niece or a nephew, um, and they're playing on your emotion, and they say, hey, grandma, it's me, your favorite granddaughter. You won't believe it, but we were traveling in Mexico, and now we're stuck for whatever reason. We're in quarantine, we're in jail, whatever the bad reason, and we can't leave until we pay X amount of dollars. And you know that I'm, I'm strapped for cash right now, and so if you could please help me out and wire me that money please don't tell my mom. It would be so embarrassing. I promise I'll tell her when I get home, can we just keep this between us? And they swear you to secrecy. They try to rush you. Oh gosh, my, I can only talk for three more minutes. You know, the calling card's running out. They won't let me talk to anybody else. This is the only call I'm able to make. And they use all sorts of information to engage in what we call social engineering um, and use social media accounts of your loved ones to be able to more convincingly impersonate your loved one. Um, so figuring out where your grandkids might go to college um, or maybe where they're from, make the story seem legitimate. Um, they might involve somebody else, another scammer to be in the background to be like, hello, miss, uh, your call, you got to end that call soon. I'm not going to let you call anybody else, whatever it is, somebody else to, to play the bad guy. Um, and they're really banking on your love and concern to wire the money. And again, remember we said red flag, someone asking you to wire money, 
major red flag. Um, it's called the grandparent scam because most frequently I, I've seen it, um, someone impersonating a, a grandchild um, and they're really pressuring you to, to keep this information secret and to send the type of payment that can't be recovered if you realize it's a scam. So it's the gift card payments, it's the wiring the money um, and really making it seem like an emergency situation. So as with our other advice, slow down and verify. Um, resist that urge to act immediately, even if it seems very dramatic and very serious. Um, I tell people, and I think, what are we on? Item number five, maybe on our to-do list. Um, talk to your family members and come up with, I know this sounds kind of silly, but come up with like a code word. So if they are in this sort of emergency situation and they call you and they need money, you ask for the code word. And if the scammer won't give it to you or they keep brushing you off, you'll know that that's not your grandson, your granddaughter, your nephew, whoever might be in trouble. Um, so it could be you know, something that they really are the only group of people that would know. And it's not something that they're gonna put on social media, right? So you wanna keep it uh, private within the, the family discussion and not on social media, not out there in, in the public. Um, so that if you get that phone call, you say, okay, dear granddaughter, Mary, I'm going to ask you for the code word. And if she doesn't say cotton candy or, or whatever the code word is, you know that it's not her and that it's not a legitimate um, phone call. One other thing you can do is if you're on the phone with the person who's a scammer and you're still not quite sure what's happening, using another means of communication to try to verify. So maybe they called your landline, pull out your cell phone and call another family member and say, I've got this person on the line that says that granddaughter so-and-so is trapped in another country and she needs me to wire money. And that person can say, oh gosh, no, she's right here with me. Or I know that I just took her back to school yesterday. She's not in another country. Um, and, and trying to check out that story. And really at the end of the day, don't wire the money or give gift cards over the phone. That's not the way that these transactions are, are gonna play out. If, if there is a need for an emergency you know, um, verification, it's, it's not gonna be wiring money. Those are big red flags. Um, and again, if it's coming from you know, number you don't recognize, it's an unexpected number, you didn't think that family member was even traveling, um, all of those things that in the back of your mind, if you have the time to slow down and think about, will come to the front of your mind, that's what the scammer is banking on you ignoring, right? They're banking on you rushing and thinking that this is dramatic and keeping it secret so that you don't think about those, those thoughts. You don't have time to think about it. Um, and I, I wanna leave you with um, something that I, I think you've probably heard, your, your mother's probably told you, but if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Um, these scammers, as I said, are, are con men, they are, are confident and they're trying to get you to rush through and make these decisions um, without verifying who they are um, and, and spending your hard earned money. It's, it's your money, it's your decision to enter into these transactions. Um, so if you're the senior consumer yourself or you're a caregiver for one, um, really, making sure that you verify all of the details of these transactions um, is gonna be key to preventing that financial, financial exploitation um, and that financial loss of, of money, of the hard earned money that, that folks have accumulated um, in their retirement. I think I've left just a few minutes um, at the end here. If there's questions, I was gonna rely on Jim to be my moderator um, and I'll put my contact information up for, for just a little bit more before I, I close out of the presentation. Uh, but I would say thank you very much for your time today. Well, thank you. It was great. That was a lot of information. So uh, I was taking some notes as we were going through here. What would be something like, say, for instance, I've, I've done this a couple of times where I've contacted your office um, on things that were not personally, you know, I didn't have it, my family or whatever did not have a personal loss. So, I mean, we didn't have a reason for that. It was just, I was kind of giving heads up type things, I guess, as a, uh, you know, I, I had a situation where we had this group that, that somebody had told us about that was potentially interested in buying my mom's farm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So she was a widow. She's, you know, it was time for her to start looking at selling this. And I met with them. Now at the time I had my real estate shirt on. Okay. So it was like, you know, they, you know, they, I was not hiding who I was. Okay. And they made this presentation that when I, and we just, we were not interested and we walked away, but they were basically, they're all, it was going to be, they had a group of investors and it was all, you know, something that they had special programs that would just deal with these investors. Nobody would know the place for sale, all that kind of stuff, which I didn't see where the advantage to her was there getting a, you know, getting a less audience. So then I got home and, I, and we said no. And I got home thinking about going, you know, this was basically a listing presentation. Okay. <laughs> 
you know, it wasn't called that, but that's, you know, it was locking her up for six months. It was you know, exclusivity. And then I looked up to find out if either one had a real estate license, neither did. I looked up to see if either one had an attorney's license, neither did, you know, so I then, you know, contacted your office too. I said, cause my little old lady mom was there with a son who's in real estate. Okay. But, but, you know, what if some other, somebody else gets this, has these meetings, you know, so, and you guys did uh, address that and get them to uh, cease and desist, I believe. But, um, but I see that kind of stuff. Now, I, I, I just turned one into the attorney general the other day, happened to know his private. <laughs> so I sent him this thing that came in the mail because I found it annoying. Again, it didn't, impact me but it was a home warranty letter that was written like you would get if from an insurance company that you were didn't pay your insurance on time and you're or from a mortgage company saying you know you, you're out of time on this you've got to get this resolved right now it was written in such a manner which is all bs you know and i could see how someone would panic you know and do that so is that the kind of things that would that be beneficial for people to have those kind of things? Or is it just when you've been damaged or? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. I think um, anytime you've been personally damaged, obviously, please reach out and let us know. Um, but even in the instance of, of like that home warranty letter, um, I have a, a matter that I worked on where all we had was kind of a generic you know, return center and a PO box, uh, but it had some deceptive information in in what they were, you know, putting in in the advertisement it had to do with wills and estate planning. Right. Um, and we were able to to trace it back and work, you know, our investigative process and you know the post office and and other folks to figure out the company behind it um, to stop those solicitations from going out to Indiana consumers with those those misrepresentations in it. So even if it's one of those where you've seen it and you're like, well, I know that this isn't actually a letter from the warranty company, but you're not sure your neighbor or the next person who gets it would be able to tell that it's it's a scam. Um, I mean, it, it doesn't hurt to let us know, because um, honestly, the more reports that we get of something, the more aware of, we, aware of it we are, and we know the, the spread of it. So if it's just a few, you know, the odds are people aren't going to get scammed. But if it's kind of blanketing the state, and a lot of people are getting it, um, and it's got something in it that we think is a misrepresentation or might be false or deceptive, um, even if you haven't lost money, we still want to know about it. All right, well, thank you. So anything else that you would like to say before we get away here? I, I was looking to see if we had any questions. I think people are probably doing I am taking notes on what they've got here. So we will be put you know, publishing this video into Life's Copilot into our uh, video library. So it will go in there. Uh, it will go on our Facebook page. I guess it's right now going on our Facebook page on our Facebook Live as well. And I will get you a copy personally as well. So you have to do with as you please. But anybody else have any questions or anything? Or Tamara, do you have something you want to make sure that that last thing was like, please don't forget this. So right, don't forget your to-do list, right? So we were doing your your bank password, your credit report, your credit freeze, and ooh, gonna have to go back and check the recording for the rest of your to-do list. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very excited about this. And when you get your uh, next book ready, then you know the on the on the consumer protection, let us know and let's we'll do this again. Absolutely, sounds great. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye.